Tonight, we're here to celebrate the launch of a brand new journal called Flavor. Uh, and we're also, of course, delighted to have many of the uh, chemists, researchers, and chefs from the uh, famous, now world famous restaurant Copenhagen at Noma. We're delighted that they're not only coming to talk to us, but they're also going to allow us to sample at some point. So what will happen during the evening is that uh, samples will be brought to the end of your rows, and we will invite you to take a piece or a pinch, depending on what you're given, and then pass it on. So don't worry, things will come to you, and, and uh, if something hasn't come to you, j just raise a hand and we will soon be with you. Now this evening would really not have been possible without uh, the idea and the tremendous uh, effort and support of all the people at Biomed Central and especially thanks to uh, Matt Cockrell and his staff for making the evening possible but also for the much longer future making the journal come into existence and I know he will say a word or two uh, to you about it so Matt Cockrell is the managing director of Biomed Central and I'm now going to invite him to start the proceedings. Matt. Barry for helping to host this event in this uh, great venue. Um, so as Barry mentioned, tonight's event is the launch of the Open Access Journal Flavor. So I did want to just say a few words about um, why we've launched the journal and why Open Access is important. So Open Access to scientific research is quite simple. It means there's no paywall um, around the content. Anybody can read that research. And why is that important? Well, within science it's important because it breaks down barriers between disciplines. And there's no better example of an interdisciplinary research field than flavor research, there's research going on in neuroscience, and psychology, nutrition, public health. It's all interrelated, it all has implications. And you don't want researchers just reading the tea research in their own area. If they can read from other fields as well, that's helpful. But also, this research shouldn't be going on in an ivory tower, in isolation from the real world, in isolation from industry, in isolation from um, those who have got an interest in, in food and flavour. And we see more and more collaborations between chefs and researchers, and so that's really facilitated if there aren't these barriers around the research, if you don't need a subscription to have access to it. And it's great today to know that in the audience we have representatives of all those different groups, we have chefs, we have food writers and bloggers, we have people working in the food industry, we have researchers, and again, all those people can sh use an open access journal as a, a common forum for sharing the results of um, research. Now, in, in starting the journal, we were very, very lucky to be, get us as one of our co-editors-in-chief, Pam Moller, um, from Copenhagen, which has clearly become a major center, not just of, um, of well, worldwide gastronomy, and also of leadership in the application of science to, um, to <coughs> developing um, in innovation in flavour. And it was interesting reading about NOMA recently that they, there's a feeling that they're coming to the, the end of the number of different edible foods it's possible to forage uh, in, in Denmark. And so that, but that means it's all more important to look at the, for innovation from other sources. And so you know, science has an important role to play in developing uh, food and flavour. Um, and so, yeah, with that, I'd like to hand over to the uh, co editor in chief of uh, the journal Flavour. Uh, I, <clears throat> I have about 15 minutes just to introduce you to flavor, what it is, and later on you will taste wonderful new flavors. But just for starters, I think we should have a demo. And Nandita, if you could have your people pass around uh, trays of jelly beans. And I, these are not <laughs> particularly Nordic, they're not particularly new, but they're very, they're, they're very they, they can be used to illustrate uh, some of the wonders of, of flavor perception. So I would ask you to take two jelly beans each, and please take two of the same color. Right. And, and, and while the logistics works its 
Today, uh, I will, in, in this brief presentation, I will define and hope that you will appreciate the various after this demo. Then I will give uh, three examples of, of what we would like to publish in the journal based on work of editorial board members of the journal. It will be very sketchy and very brief, and it will in no way sort of, uh, uh, cover all aspects. Um, but that is what I will do in the next 15 minutes. And we be about, I think, that, that uh, as we already heard, uh, that, that flavor perception, food perception is a multi-sensory uh, uh, thing. And uh, if you think about it, or if you have not thought about it before, then you will learn something new. That besides taste from the tongue, with the basic taste, salt, sweetness, etc., smell, the sense of smell also plays an enormous role in uh, flavor perception, as uh, does touch and something we call trigeminality or pungency. Uh, when you eat chili and, and, and other hot spices, it is actually the, the sensation of hotness has its own nervous uh, system, so to speak. So, and, and, and obviously that plays a, an enormous role, as does vision in, in terms of expectation of what we will have. Uh, temperature and interoception is uh, uh, the sort of <coughs> sensation of the physiological state of the body. And that plays an enormous role also in appreciation of flavor. <laughs> so, what is flavor? Well, flavor is the integration, as of now not very well described, uh, but the integration somewhere in the brain of all these sensations. Uh, that is what flavor is, and is normally what we call how food tastes. And this is now when I hope you all have uh, a jelly bean. So please, take a jelly bean uh, and add a cup. <laughs> <laughs> this is important. Block your nose, and that can be done with two fingers, like this. And then um, So if, if you block your nose and chew the jelly bean, No breathing. <laughs> and of course, that's what that is in the Anyway, uh, Jelly bean, and it was sour and sweet. <laughs> now, of course, you haven't swallowed it yet, so you have an extra jelly bean because if you now breathe through your nose, that's usually when we breathe, um, you, you, you will get a fruity uh, uh, perception of this, but without, with, with, without um, breathing. That is to say, without the sensation of smell, you only get what the tongue brings to the brain, saltiness and sourness. So this, when it works, is a, an illustration that the taste, what we sort of in common language refer to as the taste of foods, involve all these many different senses. And flavor, as I said, is the scientific, uh, uh, you know, is an attempt for the science of flavor uh, wants to understand how all of this takes place and not only from the neuro 
scientific point of view that I have to be more involved in, but also in the repercussions it, 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 it has sociologically and in relation to nutrition, etc. Well, just to let you know what, what uh, uh, took place before, in this, uh, in, in this uh, image that I borrowed from Dana Small, um, you, you, you see two roots of, of, uh, of, of uh, ways we can smell an odor. It can either be orthonasal, like when you sniff, or it can be retronasal, like when we chew. And the <clears throat> odorants are, are transferred into uh, the nose from sort of the back stairs. And that is what is uh, important uh, uh, in, in, in food perception and flavor. And then I said that I would give a couple of examples of, of the work that the new journal um, would like to publish. And why not, since Dana Small has done some wonderful work on, on, on the olfaction, the sensation of smell, why not give a couple of examples? of what she's done. So with uh, imaging, fMRI uh, imaging, Dana and co-workers uh, have demonstrated that we have different or differential neural responses evoked by orthonasal and retronasal perception. That is to say that, that, that the, the olfactory brain is not one thing, but it depends on the task uh, 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 the organism is involved in. And, and if we chew and, and uh, smell is retronasal, it turns out that, that it is different bits of brain. Of course they are overlapping, but there are different bits of brain uh, that are active compared to the sniffing uh, situation. And further, they have shown that uh, there are several uh, substrates for anticipatory, that is to say, sniffing, uh, uh, finding out what is there on the plate. <coughs> you, you, you might sniff your food before you eat it. Uh, so even if you confine yourself to, uh, to foods, sniffing behavior evokes different uh, um, activities in the brain than consummatory uh, behavior that is when you actually eat. Uh, so there is much more to flavor than one might have thought. Uh, now, this I borrow from Gordon Shepherd, who just put out a nice book, somewhat nice book, <laughs> Neurogastronomy. <laughs> Uh, four or five months ago, uh, where he discusses the coming together of, of considerations about foods and neuroscience. So he has cooked up this phrase of neurogastronomy. And, and, and as you can see in the image here, uh, uh, he, Gordon has illustrated all the different parts of brain that are involved in, in food perception and appreciation. All right, enough of, of uh, neuroimaging. Um, we only, we would like to think, we only eat what we like. So we, we prefer one thing as opposed to another. And and uh, as it happens, uh, we are born with only two likings, namely of sweetness and fattiness. And that is rather reasonable from nature to have coded us genetically like that. Because for the first six months of our lives, what we eat, our food is a sweet and fatty liquid, right? And, and the uh, Mother's milk. Um, and, and since you cannot sort of uh, argue with a newborn child about you should eat your vegetables or something like that, 
uh, it is kind of nice to be born with preferences for what the child should eat, what the baby should eat. But besides our, our, uh, our, our, our these two uh, flavors, sweetness and fattiness, all the rest of this of it is learned. So preferences are formed. So we talk of preference formation. And then, and then you know, a whole new field opens up. When and what are the rules and under which circumstances can you get from here to there? And how can we teach people to eat more healthy foods than unhealthy foods, blah, blah, blah. There are very many questions there that the journal will address, hopefully. But I, I uh, took this piece of work from Ben Marshall, uh, as I would say, he's also an editorial board member, where they, they demonstrated extremely nicely that, that uh, already in the fetal state are we influenced by what our uh, mother eats. And how did they demonstrate that? They ran an experiment in France uh, where anise, sort of licorice type of flavors, are used. It, it, it is not uncommon to, to, uh, to uh, drink or eat anise flavor in France. So they, they got hold of, of uh, 15, uh, no, 25, 24 pregnant women and divided them into groups of 12. And in, in the anise eating group, uh, these uh, women who were about to give birth 14 days later uh, were offered uh, various candies and other foods with anise flavor in it. The other group uh, uh, just ate their normal diet um, with no extra anise. And then they uh, immediately after birth, I think these data, I think these, these, these sweet babies, uh, they are three hours old. And, and, and uh, they, they, they measured reactions to anise flavor on a cotton stick. And, and they did it in various ways. As you see, uh, uh, the no wonder, here you go. Uh, yeah, oops, that was not what I did. It. Oh. Oh. Uh, this is dangerous. <laughs> I think I better not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are uh, sort of, uh, frames of video recording of children's or newborn babies reaction to anise flavor on the stick. And, and the one in A uh, is the child of uh, a mother who ate anise uh, for the last 14 days of her pregnancy, whereas the other ones are from non-anise eating mothers. And, and uh, we cannot really go into the details here, but there are all sorts of ways one can quantify facial expressions. <laughs> and and uh, maybe you will agree with Benoit that, that uh, B, C, and uh, D really do not uh, uh, appreciate this flavor very much, whereas A does. But if, if, if you say, ah, this is a little bit flimsy, right? Uh, <laughs> let, let's, let, let, let's try it and sort of uh, a little bit more natural science types here. Uh, and if you look at the panel in what's paper two, uh, they have quantified the mean in, in A, uh, uh, the mean duration of negative facial configurations to uh, uh, the black one is anise and, 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 and uh, the white one is a control over. And you see the non-anise uh, consuming mothers, babies, really do not like uh, uh, the smell of, of anise, whereas there is, there is no, no, no difference between a control order and the anise order for, for the uh, 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 babies whose mothers had 
been exposed to it. In B, they have quantified what's called mouthing activities. That's to say, you know, how, how much does the mouth move uh, when uh, presented with these uh, orders. And you see that, that uh, the anise eating uh, uh, mothers and kids uh, made much more mouthing movements when they are presented with this evidence. And in C, they, they have quantified head orientation in, in a choice situation where, where the child uh, had a cotton with a control board on one side and the anise on the other side. And, and if there is more movement towards the anise odor, that is interpreted to mean that, 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 that they are attracted by it. And on all accounts, it is clear that, that uh, uh, children of anise odor, I should put it differently, it is clear that already in the fetal state, what our mothers ate uh, has influenced how we deal with flavors when we are born. And this goes on all along our childhood, and, and even, um, even when we grow old. There, there are all sorts of types of so-called conditional learning that, that uh, change our preferences all along. So, preferences are important because they decide what we eat. They, we are not born with them, they change all the time as a result of what we are exposed to. That was the point of that. And I don't know how, do I have two more minutes or? I have two more minutes. So I will give still another example, uh, this time uh, about uh, hot spices, chili and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, the, you know, when can you raise two hypotheses? Uh, one is not really a hypothesis any longer. In the first one, that strong spices increase metabolism. This can be quantified by, by measuring uh, uh, the carbon uh, dioxide that people ex exhale after, after, the, um, after a meal. And, and it turns out, uh, this is based, most of this work is Japanese, but there's also some in Copenhagen, actually, uh, and in the Netherlands, uh, that, that, that you, can, you can beef up your, your, fat, the, the, your fat metabolism by between 2 and 15 percent by eating chili, which is kind of very interesting. Another question, or my question is, uh, is the question whether strong spices in some ways might increase the feeling of satiety. And if that was the case, we well, yeah, imagine that they would use this for meals. And I had gone with an assistant, hence my rice, with a, a very sort of a kitchen table experiment. But I'll show you some data from it anyway. And it, they are kind of, in a, in a larger context, interesting, we would like to argue. Because we will demonstrate here, I think, I will try to prove you, <coughs> that it is possible to eat less and nevertheless like or have more uh, joy out of eating. So, you can, you can have more pleasure out of a meal and, and, and lose weight. How about that? So it, it, it's, normally they say, wow, if this tastes good, I'll eat five kilos of it. But it doesn't need to be the case. So, we, we used a very uh, sort of uh, ordinary tomato soup uh, in two variants, out of the can, Thank you, Heinz. And uh, out of the can, spiced uh, with chili to our taste. And then we measured. Uh, we gave people 50 grams of this every five minutes until they had eaten not And we measured. Well, it's not too much. Uh, uh, we measured satiety and, and hunger feelings for these two. And we did other things also. This is what this plot shows. 
And if you concentrate now on the dark blue and the dark red, and compare that in your mind to the yellow and the light blue, you will see that hunger and satiety comes to an equilibrium earlier uh, with, with the tomato soup with, with chili in it. The, the, um, and uh, you, you will also, if you look at what uh, happens by the end, see that people are more saturated. And then you might say, ooh, uh, maybe that's because they don't like this stuff. <laughs> but it is not. If you look at we also ask them how well they like it. So they scored it by like so it's a much on a scale from 0 to 10 or something. You see that, that people actually enjoyed the hot soup more than they did the ordinary. So they ate less, one would like to think, but they enjoyed it more. So maybe quality can replace quantity. That's one of the things that would be wonderful if, we, if it was possible. Uh, and and uh, this just confirms this, 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 you know, this demonstrates how much they want another portion of it. And you see in the beginning, uh, subjects want uh, another portion, uh, more of the hot one. They like it more, right? But at the end, it's the other way around, because they have been such so these were three examples of what the journal flavor could, could cover. But there could be many, many other things. Like flavor the journal will publish interdisciplinary articles on flavor, its generation and perception, and its influence on behavior and nutrition, as well as articles on the psychophysical, psychological, and chemical aspects of flavor, including those which take brain imaging. Focus. And we should have added, but we have done it later on, that we expect papers ranging all the way from philosophy and psychology and economics over psychology and neuroscience, all the way to physics and chemistry. And we hope to make flavor a journal not only for scientists, but also accessible to chefs and other food professionals who would not normally be designed to be clinical. That we will ask of our authors that they work on their language and, and, and forget the, 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 the specific lingo that goes into appendices. Um, now, I have listed here, uh, together with Peter Barham, a number of, of, of challenges that we would like to see in here. You, you can read more of them in, uh, in the editorial. Uh, but since I think I have gone way over my time, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll just take the last one. And take it. Even though this ought to be uh, uh, of interest to everybody who makes a dollar out of producing food, I am not aware that anybody can solve the so-called inverse problem in cooking. <coughs> so what the heck is an inverse problem in cooking? This is a mathematical phrase. Uh, and because in, in, in mathematics and your physiology, you know, you, sometimes you have to solve the equation in backward order, so it's called the inverse. And this is a very simple problem, but I do not uh, know of anybody who has really put very much effort into it. And it consists of the following. From a perceptual and physical description of the perfect end result of a cooking process, Okay, so you know exactly what is perfect. You, you can describe, describe that physically and perceptually. Can we describe the physical treatments? Because there might be more than one actually that will take you to it. But describe the physical treatment of the raw materials that will result in a given optimal end result. You know, this should be easy peasy. Uh, uh, but but uh, I, I don't. I have not seen any serious scientific uh, endeavor in this. But I'm sure that flavor will, will, will launch or will, will bring this to the market and maybe inspire some people to do it. And that was what I wanted to say. Thank you.